Welcome everyone and thank you all for joining this week's Next Normal series from Worth Live on how the current crisis is changing the WNBA. Firstly, I hope you and your loved ones are keeping well during what continues to be a challenging time for so many people. I'm Juliet Scott Cropsford, CEO at Worth Media and your moderator for the next hour and I'm excited to be joined today with special guest Kathy Engelbert, Commissioner of the WNBA. Nafisa Collier, WNBA player for the Minnesota Lynx and 2019 Rookie of the Year, and Kathleen Entwistle, Private Wealth Advisor at Morgan Stanley Private Wealth Management. Hi, everyone. Hi, Julia. Good to yeah. see, you. see you. Good to see you. Um, so our, before we kick off, um, for the audience, our, our intention at Worth is to create conversations that help inspire and inform our community, many of whom are investors, founders, private business owners and leaders, and who want to leave a positive impact on the world and help to create a more inclusive and equal economy and society for the benefit of everyone. And, and, and we, we term that as Worth Beyond Wealth. So we hope you enjoy this session. Forward thinking is the essence of this series, The Next Normal, where Worth is looking ahead to what the world looks like after the current crisis passes and how specific businesses, industries, sectors are not only responding to the existing challenges, but also what they're doing to transform themselves, to pivot, to prepare and to thrive in the future. As the WNBA get ready for its opening weekend next weekend, dedicated to the Black Lives Matter movement. This week's session is focused on how the league is turning adversity into opportunity, how basketball is vying for equality and how 2020 has affected women in sports. So we're delighted to have Commissioner Kathy Engelbert, player Nafisa Collier and private wealth advisor Kathy Entwistle to share their perspectives on the future of sports for women. So before we get started, a few housekeeping rules. At the bottom of your screen, you have a chat, um, a chat function. If you use that uh, to ask any questions, um, please don't be shy. Um, you can either type it in to everyone or directly to me, Juliet Scott Croxford, and we can unmute you so you can ask your question directly to the speakers, or if you'd prefer to stay anonymous, I can weave it into the conversation as we go. So let's get started. Um, firstly, a personal check-in with you all. Um, Kathy, I can't believe what's happened in the last four months since we saw each other face to face at the Women and Worth Summit back in March. Um, let's just start with you, Kathy. You're down in the bubble or the wobble as, as the players are, are, are phrasing it. Um, how has the last four months been for you and how have you been managing your own well-being? Yeah, so um, thanks so much, Julia, for having us today. Um, and, you know, welcome to my, you know, one of our star players, Nifty Sakalier. But I, I'm doing as well as, as anyone can through these very challenging times. Um, you know, it's um, been a great opportunity for me personally to spend more time with my two kids. One was in college and never went back from his spring break. And my daughter had just graduated from college. So, so grateful to have time with them. We actually started something every night around 630 when I would get off the endless calls and have a little break playing a little basketball out on our street and then a little bit of ping pong in the evening with my 19 year old late night. Uh, but yes, I am down here and what uh, the players are affectionately calling the wobble. Um, but it's basically our neutral site where we're trying to create a very safe environment uh, for our players. And um, there's no more challenging time than now to put on live sports. But I think now that the players are practicing and on the court and in training camp, uh, we're, we're excited to get our 24th season tipped off next Saturday on ESPN and ABC and CBS Sports Network. Wow. And Nafisa, welcome to you as well. Um, uh, we'll get a bit into sort of what, what life is like in the Wubble in, in a minute, but um, I'd love to hear sort of how the last four months have been for you. And also if you could just share a bit, a bit of um, background in terms of your journey into basketball. I know you went to UConn um, and yeah, I'd love to hear a bit about how you, how you ended up at the WNBA. Yeah, thanks for having me. The last four months have been crazy, just like everyone else. But, um, you know, like Kathy, it's been great to be home. I haven't been this home that long since I was in high school. So it was really cool to be with my family and with my fiance and just have that much time. We played endless games of Monopoly multiple times a day. So I'm pretty tired of that game. But it was so fun to be home. And uh, yeah, my journey, I started playing basketball around fourth grade. I played a bunch of sports growing up, but I moved to St. Louis when I was 16 and then I kind of honed in on basketball. That's when I kind of knew that I wanted to 
pursue just basketball instead of the other sports I was playing. So I ended up going to UConn. I played there for four years. It was amazing. Um, I played with, you know, Brianna Stewart, Morgan Tuck. I had a great senior class. We won a championship that year. Um, made it to the Final Four every other year, but, you know, we lost there. And then I got drafted sixth to Minnesota, and this is my second year here, and I love it. So it's been a fun ride. Wow. And you were named 2019 Rookie of the Year, right? Yes, I was. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, that was my favorite. Um, I, I flew around the country giving out our performance awards from the season, and my favorite was when I went to uh, give Nafisa hers. They did a great ceremony. Her parents were there. It was awesome. It was so fun, yeah. That's awesome. And, and Kathy and we're so welcome. Um, you, you've been a, a partner with us throughout this season. Um, how are you doing? And, and, and just please introduce yourself. Sure. Um, I'm Kathy Entwistle. I am a private wealth advisor at Morgan Stanley, but mostly I will say I am so passionate about young girls and women and, and empowering uh, women to understand their own power and how they can use their their money and their wealth to align with their values and succeed in in the world so i'm super excited to be here today and um to spend some time hearing about uh what kathy and, and nafisa is are doing um with basketball with women with sports with the w um, nba and um, congratulations on your recognition last year that's tremendous um it's really exciting to have you here and and kathy when when we were um when we were talking at the women and worth summit back in march you were sharing um a bit about your vision to drive a different way of looking at, at women's sports both through a sort of quantitative lens and a qualitative lens and obviously you had started to make real progress, um, obviously negotiated the historic collective bargaining agreement. How did the, how did the pandemic affect those goals that you've been working towards and, and, and to what extent are they back on track now? Yeah, Julia, this is a fabulous question. As with any business trying to navigate the impact of, of COVID-19, we had to look at a lot of areas of our business to see where we could innovate and adapt. And I'm firm believer having had over three decades of business experience that a crisis, while it amplifies the weaknesses that existed going into it, it also is an opportunity to fix it. And I think you said in the lead, up, lead in, turning adversity to opportunity. So that's what we need to do here, but this is really hard. So our goals have remained consistent, lead with a player first agenda, drive a different way of looking at women's sports, drive new revenue models and um, get more coverage for the league. Uh, market the league, market players like Nafisa, drive rivalries, and we're still working on all that, but it is really hard in this pandemic because now we've shifted to the number one thing being the health and safety of our players, and it's pretty existential for women's sports and certainly for the WNBA to have a league this year and to have a season. So um, as we look to tip it off in uh, a week from this Saturday on the 25th, um, this is still part of our strategy. Capitalize off the momentum. There's some amazing storylines emerging uh, with teams like Minnesota and Phoenix and Seattle. New York has the number one pick in Sabrina Unescu. So we really are, while the pandemic is really making it hard for us, you know, this is existential. We'll, we'll hopefully we'll have a successful season and then move on to next year, which by the way, will be our 25th anniversary so again we need more media coverage and espn has been a great partner as well as cbs sports network but we need more and that's what we're working on and and how could how did your career obviously 30 years at deloitte and, and being the ceo there how did that prepare you for for this crisis yeah so uh, you know i do look back and say you know i never thought coming in to run the WNBA, we'd be faced with you know, um, I thought maybe eventually, because I had been doing some scenario planning when I was at Deloitte around economic downturns and economic crisis, but never that it would be caused by a global health pandemic. And so think about how unusual the times that we're in. And then the social justice movement and how important that was to our players all year round, not just um, in the recent times and how proud I am of our players around that. So I think, you know, maybe my last 33 years were really training me for this moment, I don't know, uh, but it's certainly something where I learned a lot about how to manage different scenarios. So even to put the season on, we had to look at no season, full season, somewhere in between, what would the playoffs look like? What would the health and safety protocols look like? What were the permutations off of those five or six scenarios? Where would we do it? In arenas without fans, not in arenas with fans without. 
So, there so, so I just think that business background prepared me for the scenario planning that we had to do coming off of our first ever virtual draft that we had in April and it was quite successful and we have an exciting rookie class. We have an exciting set of veterans now. Nafisa is essentially a veteran now that she's gotten past her rookie year, but you know, we have great storylines, but you know, it's, it's hard and um, hopefully all the scenario planning and hard work will come in handy, whatever we hit while we're down here. How does it feel being referred to as a veteran, Nafisa? <laughs> Anything better than a rookie is good. So <laughs> I don't know if I've reached veteran status yet, but I definitely like the sound of it. Uh, so last week, I think the players arrived in, in Florida into, into the bubble, wobble. Um, how, what's it like down there, Nafisa, and, and, and are you excited to be back on the court? I, I read a really touching um, diary entry from Liberty rookie Sabrina um, Ionescu today, and uh, she was just explaining a bit about what it was like leaving home and, and, and coming down there. How's it been for you? I think it's been, um, the circumstances are not good, but I think it's really cool to be in such close proximity, like with other teams, to be in this kind of situation, it feels like we're back, like in college or an AAU session or something like that. Um, it's definitely not something you would want every year, but we're here, and so to make the most out of it, I think is really important, so we're just having as much fun with it as we can, um, you know, within the safety protocols. Uh, and, sorry, what was the second part of your question? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it, was, it was about sort of what, what, it, what life is like down there for you. Um, and, and then just to build on that, sort of what precautions have been put in place? How different is it uh, for, for, for you as a player? It's really different. So when we first got here, we were quarantined for about four days where you could really only leave your room or villa for um, essential things like getting tested. Um, still every day we get tested every day. You have to wear a mask everywhere. We have a My Health app where you have to, you know, input if you have any symptoms, you have to do your temperature. Um, so they're taking really every precaution that they can in order to keep us safe. And so I think that they've done a really good job with that. And um, I'm excited to do that and then get to playing um, to start the season. Yeah, and Julia, maybe it's Kathy, I'll add in, you know, it, this was kind of first quarantine in room and we had some people that weren't happy with their room. It's like freshman year in college when you get dropped off, your parents drive away, you know, you're probably not going home till Thanksgiving break and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm here for two and a half months and, and you're just in a different environment. But I think we, we IMG Academy is, which is where we're, they're the official host of the 2020 season. Um, they jumped on the issues they um, fixed a lot of things in the first couple of days. We continued, as Nafisa said, with the medical protocol and the testing. And I think um, it, one of the things we did is uh, Kinza has been a great partner. They gave a, every player and every staff member that's here a Bluetooth thermometer. So temperature checks are an important part of making sure we can identify whether anyone is a health risk. And so Kinza has, has come through with thermometers for everybody and those upload automatically Bluetooth into an app. Um, we have a My Health app that Nafisa referred to that has a symptom form you fill out every day. So we're doing everything we can, but started with four days of quarantine, then it was teams only, and ultimately we'll open it up and hopefully that teams can interact more socially. But right now it's still all physical distancing, wearing masks as we settle, um, you know, the site. And some of the changes and things that you've had to go through over the last few months, so I understand that as part of the plan to restart the, the season, players who opted into play would receive 100% of their salary. How important was that for you to make that a reality and, and, and how challenging was it to make it a reality? Yeah, so no matter how you slice it and look at so many businesses and so many different industries and small businesses, this is a huge financial challenge for all of us. Uh, and so, but we felt since we just came off a historic and progressive collective bargaining negotiation and agreement in January and the player leadership, you know, we worked with them and the player leadership, you know, obviously came back to the table to say, even though we're playing a shortened season, we want full pay. We started, you know, doing analysis. And again, the financial part of this is really hard. So we had, but, but we knew how existential this was and we knew how important it was if with players were going to be fired up about a 24th season, we ended up agreeing to pay them 100% of their salaries. So 
Um, it, it was important. It's hard because financially, you know, think about just all the medical health and protocols and the testing and everything. And that's why it's great when partners step up. AT&T has stepped up and some of our other partners continue to step up. Um, but we need more. We need more corporate sponsors to, to step up and help us get through this year into the next. Kathy Emerson, I'm looking at you. <laughs> I know you had some questions around the business and finance. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. So we were speaking a little bit earlier before we, we got on live and I was saying to Kathy how impressed I am with her background, her business acumen, the, the years at Deloitte, the fact that you shifted into this new role. And I would say one of the things that you and I spoke about back in March um, at the Worth uh, Women in Worth conference was about empowering um, the players and and other women associated with the WNBA um, to understand their financial picture, understand when they're getting that full salary or they're getting sponsorships or you know money's coming in to really understand what that means to them and how to manage that for a longer term view as opposed to, you know, going through it. So you, you were, you know, sharing your insights there too. So I would, I would um, love to hear your thoughts on, on ways that you feel that uh, all of us can step up and, and support um, the women uh, in understanding their financial picture and really taking that step forward. Yeah, so uh, absolutely, um, you know, a call to action for support for these elite athletes and, uh, you know, Nafisa, uh, um, you know, can talk as well about how important that is, how important the marketing of the players, how important it is around things, Kathy, like you were talking about around financial well-being, mental health and mental well-being, you know, and that's one thing, you know, at Deloitte, you know, hopefully I'm known for putting in, you know, policies that put people first and, you know, not just financially, but certainly from, you know, mental health and an exercise and a well-being. Uh, and, and so that's what we're trying to do here as well. So yeah, any, any help you can give us, we'd love it. What, what do you think, Nafi says, uh, in terms of the, the whole mental health, physical health, um, understanding, you know, everything to become like the wellness picture, including, including finances, like I would say, you know, when you think about money, does it intimidate you or are you excited about it and um, really want to embrace it? Mm -hmm. um, whenever I think about money, anytime it excites me. So, <laughs> but uh, they've been doing a great job with the physical mental wellness here in the bubble, um, making sure that every day we have available time to work out if we want to, making sure that mental health resources are available. Our living arrangements are great. Um, the food is amazing just making sure that this is the best, like I said, making the best out of a bad situation. They've done an amazing job making the bubble or wobble um, a nice place to be. So I really give props to the league for what they're doing because it's it's been great. Uh, I, I want to ask just at the impact of, of, of playing with without fans in attendance, both on the business side, but also how that feels as a player as well. Um, and obviously you haven't started yet, Nafisa, but what's the, feel, the sense of sort of feeling with, with playing with, with, without fans there? It, it's hard um, and it might be a little awkward, especially because you can really hear every sound in the gym. It's kind of like a scrimmage. Um, playing in front of our fans, especially at Minnesota, we have amazing fans. We have people, so many people at our games and they're cheering loud for us. So you really get hyped up from that. And even playing at opposing teams, like sometimes you feed off the crowd if they're booing you even. Just the crowd plays a big part and they make it really fun. Um, so it'll definitely be weird this year, but obviously it's understandable why they can't do it and which is why we need our fans in each of our cities to support us as much as they can on social media and things like that and to stay engaged with us watching our games because uh, we really miss them and we can't wait to get back to them. And, and, and Juliet, this is yeah. one of those areas that um, was one of my pillars was fan engagement of my three part strategy, player first, revenue and and fan engagement. And so obviously fan attendance makes up a good portion of our revenue as a league. Yeah. Um, you know, so this is is um, devastating financially, but we're, we're going to be seeing a lot um, we're going to be piloting. I'll call it some new ways to connect with fans at home working closely with our broadcast and technology partners to enhance game telecasts, debuting a new experience among fans. So 
we're trying different camera angles. We're trying a tap to cheer app. So you've been hearing about these tap to clap or tap to cheer apps that um, do different things. Um, you know, it's, it's all going to be pilot. It's going to be the first time anyone is trying any of these things. And I think what hopefully will come out of this is some innovative ways in the future when we can get fans back to use technology to virtually interact with fans at home during games. And we also want audio to be the best possible mix because it's going to be pretty quiet as Nafisa just described versus Minnesota where I went to a few games last year and they have a great crowd. Um, so we'll, we're trying to work on music during the games, you know, that we usually have and, and have that, but it really, our goal is to pilot a few things, by the way, some things our fans will probably end up hating and hopefully some things they'll like and, and we'll, we'll pilot those and we'll, we'll put those in more longer term, but this is, um, this is, it's all going to be different. And how much of, uh, of that stuff that you're piloting is is done in, in collaboration with, with your with your key partners and your sponsors? Because presumably you've had to kind of pivot the way you work with them as well, right? Yeah, definitely, especially for uh, the what, what they call in sports the inventory of how you advertise either during telecast or in arena. So we usually have 12 different arenas we play in where there's local sponsors, there's national sponsors, and now we have you know, basically one where we're playing the courts. So we have practice courts and we actually have two broadcast courts, but, um, but now, you know, finding ways to do digital, digital and virtual signage in arena um, and all these things just add to the cost, 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 cost. And so we're going to try to do as much as we can within the parameters that we have this year. Uh, and then again, hopefully even the digital and virtual signage will be something where we're rotating sponsors and gives us you know, an idea of how to do it. And as if you said, or maybe as you referred to, Juliet, we are a very important part of the season is dedication to the 2020 season to social justice. We'll have Black Lives Matter on the court um, where normally we would probably have a sponsor. So that's really important to the players to dedicate this season to their social justice platform. And, and, and moving on to that, and, and a reminder just um, to, to our audience that are listening, please do support submit questions to me, Juliet Scott Croxford, or, or in the chat to, to everyone, and, and we'll, we'll weave them in. Um, addressing inequality and, and systemic racism through sports, the WNBA have, have been a, a huge advocate following the, um, the, the devastating murder of George Floyd. And I know last week you announced that you, you would be dedicating this season to social justice with the launch of the Justice Movement platform. Um, and I think the creation of the WNBA Social Justice Council. Can you tell us a bit more of, about both of those initiatives? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, one thing I, I, by the way, tomorrow's my one year anniversary in the role. And I came in this role and did not know how the WNBA players have a long history of activism. And maybe I didn't, I didn't read enough um, in my prior life, but I was pretty busy raising two kids and CEO of Deloitte. But, you know, we had like the former MVP who, you know, would have played with, you know, Nafisa on uh, the links, Maya Moore, and, you know, fight for changes to the criminal justice system and actually just recently won that fight uh, that she was fighting for. So um, this movement that's coming about now that obviously has a lot of attention on it is no different for these WNBA players who are so socially conscious and, and community minded. So they are leading the way here. We worked hard with the Players Association and the players to announce the, loss, the, the launch of the WNBA Justice Movement. And so we're creating a social justice council. And that mission is to be a driving force around change. And now that, as Nafisa said, it's kind of odd to all have all of our teams together for the first time in WNBA history. Everyone is here together uh, in Florida. So um, really an important societal issues change. And I think we're really excited to, you know, get player produced podcasts, other activations to address this longstanding um, inequality, implicit bias, systemic racism. And, um, you know, we're um, one of the things the players are doing is they will wear Brianna Taylor, who was one of the female victims of police brutality on the back of their jerseys during our tip off weekend, the weekend of the 25th and 26th of July, uh, as a, a signal and sign of how important it is. Uh, to also support the female victims of, um, of police brutality. And Nafisa, how, how, have, how in setting up um, the platform um, and the council, how have how is your ideas fed into that and other players' ideas fed into that? Um, it's been a really great opportunity being in the bubble for us to come together. 
um, as a league and try to make change, not just, you know, within our WBA community, but throughout the country. And my team, uh, the Lynx, has actually created a, com a committee within our team called the Change Starts With Us Committee. And we're really looking forward to affect change within the Minneapolis community. Uh, it's a place where, you know, we love to play in front of our fans, but more importantly, it's a place that a senseless murder took place. Um, and we've already tried to start actions by, we had a Zoom meeting with the mayor of Minneapolis and the police chief, um, along with the Timberwolves players. And so we're really excited to continue these conversations over the next months. And, and you had, um, I, I was reading that you spoke to, to the mayor and the, uh, and the police force in, in Minnesota, is that right? What, what, uh, share a bit about that experience. Yeah, it was, um, it was really cool that we got to talk to them just about, they talked to us about, you know, what happened, um, acknowledging that it was not okay and it was something that shouldn't have, have happened and something that they're going to try to make sure that never happens again. Um, telling us, you know, the different things that they're doing to, you know, reform their police um, organization or what the mayor is doing or what we can try to do to help just having those conversations. And we got to ask as many questions as we wanted and they were really open with the conversation. So that was really cool to have that with people who are so important in our community um, so that they understand that it's really important to us and we see that it's also important to them and they're, we see that they're trying to make change. Um, I'm going to go, there's, there's lots of questions coming through. So um, uh, first of all, I want to go to Kate Luzio. Um, hi, Kate, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's not, it's not very clear, Kate. Say that again. Okay, I think it, it's hard to hear you. Um, so if, if you... That's better. That's better. I had to take my headphones off. Um, there you go. There you go. Hi. <laughs> so, um, hi, ladies. And I'm just, uh, Kathy, when you said that you were in your 24th season, I, I honestly did not realize. As a lifelong basketball player and, and lover, I didn't know that. So it's really exciting and to hear everything that you're doing in Nafisa. But I had a question, Kathy, back to your corporate sponsorship. Uh, what you alluded to in, around driving dollars there and investment. When you think about corporate sponsorships, there's so much um, in the market that's, that's already saturated. How does the WNBA compete against all of the other sports teams that are out there uh, to be successful in that? Because in my mind, um, for all of these women's athletics teams, soccer, basketball, et cetera, that actually can turn into fan engagement and can turn into more dollars for the players ultimately. So what's the strategy behind the corporate, um, these corporate sponsorships? Yeah, it's a great question. And so part of um, our strategy, especially when I came in was to take a look at, so when I learned the statistics, which I shared at the Worth Conference, you know, um, a, a couple months ago that, you know, less than 4% of all media coverage of sports covers women's sports and less than 1% of all corporate sponsorship dollars that goes to sports goes to women's sports. And much of even that, when you break down the numerator and the denominator is to individual athletes versus leagues and teams and things like that. So um, we, we really need to transform this area. Um, and, and one of the reasons that I'm still getting behind it Pandemic, you know, has delayed a, a few of the ways I was thinking about, but um, but we're still charging forward with our WNBA Changemaker platform. And one of it is just not in the vision of why it's the right thing to do to support women and women in sports, because they're the role models for the next generation of leaders, and they are the next generation of leaders. I mean, I was a college athlete in two sports at the Division One level. And, you know, it's no, it's no secret that, you know, I got a lot of leadership skills that brought me, you know, to become the first female CEO of Deloitte. So I think it's really important that when corporate sponsor sports, they look, you know, more at the gender equality issue and not just sponsor men's sports, but women. And, and we need to do a better job of putting forth the vision. We need to do a better job on how the assets of a league like ours and the other women's leagues out there, professional leagues out there, how those assets are valued, because what happens is, there's traditional metrics of how many, you know, media metrics and social media metrics. And uh, honestly, women's sports, because only think about it, if less than 4% of all media coverage of sports is women's sports. You're not going to have these huge valuations of leagues and teams and franchises because 
you're not getting as many eyes on it. So we're trying to do our part to build rivalries, build exciting play. The quality of the play on the court is excellent. So that was one thing we didn't have to transform, but we have to transform the whole ecosystem of how people view investment in a women's sports league and in these players individually or collectively, how they view the return on that. It's a return on equality. It's a diversity and inclusion play. It's a talent play for their employees to support these diverse women. We're a league of 80% black women. It's really important, I think, particularly at this time for companies to step up and want to support us. But the traditional metrics aren't the metrics. And we, we, we're trying to transform how you look at your investment if you're one of these companies to come in as a WNBA change maker, which is a significant investment in our league, or even one of our other great sponsors, because we have a variety of sponsors, but we don't have enough, and the level at which they give is not enough. So we're hoping this is our breakout season, and we were hoping that we'd have a full season. We'd take an Olympic break um, during July and August and actually support our U.S. Olympic team going for their seventh consecutive gold medal, and this would all play into our 25th anniversary season, and corporations would see the value of supporting these diverse women and then we hit a pandemic. So no excuses, but we need, it's a bit of a call to action, quite frankly. And this ultimately is about the value these women will provide in society. And, but it's not a always a quantitative analysis, like a lot of people who give money to sports leagues look quantitatively at it. it there has to be intangibles here. We have to figure out how to help corporations measure the value they're providing to society because these players will become diverse leaders of the future in their own company. So that's why when we did the collective bargaining agreement, we spent a lot of time on, you know, off season employment opportunities to help our, again, diverse and elite women athletes get jobs after not only at, during the off season, but ultimately to prepare them with skills as they go um, out of basketball into the real world, because they'll be in their mid thirties to 40, and now what do they do? They've come out of college, right into the league. And now what do they do? So this has been an important part of why I took this job. And we're still working really hard on what that looks like. But we do have a call to action out there to any company who wants to support these diverse women under that vision. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and thanks for that question, Kate. It does strike me, Kathy, that you and your leadership and the WNBA are a beacon of light um, and, and being incredibly innovative in, in changing some of the systemic issues that are underlying in many sports teams and leagues across the world. And I, I think pandemic aside, your, your player first agenda and the way that you are approaching this both from a sort of emotional aspect and a rational aspect I think there is so much that other leagues and, and teams and sports can learn from it um, and, and, and even in your response to uh, what we've seen with um, the, the, the social justice movement how come there are so many other I think sort of sports that aren't actually responding and even corporate companies that aren't responding in perhaps the way they should in a humane way. Why is the WNBA, in my opinion, getting it so right? Yeah, because we have courage. And, you know, Nafisa can speak to this. These players have an enormous amount of courage and it takes a lot of courage to be out on front on these very tough issues. And I think just, again, that's why the Social Justice Council is going to be so important because that's to bring in leaders who then can advise the players on their platform and how um, how to, you know, affect change. And, and so let me, I've been talking a lot. Let me turn it to Nafisa too on this issue. I think that's right. I think we have a lot of brave women in this league. I think we have a lot of leaders in this league who aren't afraid to speak up when um, they think, speak up for what they think is right. We have like you said, 80% of the women in this league are black. We have LGBTQ community in the league. So we speak up for the things that we're passionate about. And um, I think we feel too, as athletes, professional athletes, that we do have a platform. And it's kind of our responsibility to use that platform for good. Um, we have more eyes on us than a normal person would. So we have to use our voice to try to affect change. Thank you, Nafisa. I, I want to go to a couple more questions. There's one from Liz Lapp on, um, on uh, the, the fantasy side of WNBA. Liz, are you there? Hi, Liz. Hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Hello. 
Yes, um, I was wondering, um, you know, I'm a big fan of the WNBA League Pass and, you know, um, especially in the African-American community, they're one of the most dialed in uh, communities when it comes to technology and being on apps. So I was wondering, is there, has there been any thoughts on how to maybe um, make the app a lot more, uh, you know, have more dynamic features to it? Um, maybe also not have as many blackout dates. I'm an LA Sparks fan, so Sometimes I'm on the go and I'd love to know, be able to see it on the go. I know in the past, um, NFL and Verizon have done a lot, a lot with tablet viewing and, and on the go mobile viewing. And additionally, I think FanDuel is the only um, app right now that has a WNBA fantasy league. Um, and I think there's so much potential there. I'm wondering if there's any talks in potentially um, doing a, a fantasy league. Thank you. Liz, thank you so much for the question. So League Pass, it's, it's great that you bring it up. League Pass, for everyone that doesn't know, is our app where you can go and watch games if, if you don't have access to ESPN and when our game's on ESPN or a uh, regional sports network or CBS Sports Network or NBA TV. Uh, and so we actually um, are transforming League Pass. That was part of the transformation that we had begun before the pandemic hit. And so we're gonna, gonna have, you're gonna see a new look on it. It's not everything we wanted yet, but we're, we're gonna continue to transform it um, this season into next. So I think you'll be more pleased with it this year, but we're still going to be working hard on that. We'll also have, as I mentioned, the Tap to Cheer or Tap to Clap app, which hopefully will have some more interactive fan engagement in it as well. And on the fantasy side, um, certainly on the legalized sports betting as more states in the United States, start to approve legalized sports betting. We'll be working with different partners on that, and that's a revenue opportunity for us. Um, if you just looked at our WNBA draft on April 17th this year, you know, even just the sports betting that um, led into our draft um, was pretty interesting, and we hadn't had that level of interest before. Now it was in the middle of the first couple of weeks of the pandemic. Um, but, you know, again, we're excited to partner with partners like FanDuel and others uh, as we get into kind of the sports betting, because again, that also can bring in new fans, bring in new interest uh, into the game, obviously always protecting the integrity of the game, which is really important. So we'll be leveraging off the NBA process for that. And on the fantasy you know, team specifically, I'll, I'll check in a little more on that. It hasn't been high on my list of focus in this pandemic, but certainly it's something where if we can attract more fans. So for instance, for the first time, the, the NBA 2K um, app, um, you know, 2K game had WNBA players last September, I think it was launched, the, the 2K20 game had WNBA players where you can actually go on, on, you know, the gamified version of the game and pick Nafisa on your team and play uh, in, in the 2K environment. So we're excited about that and then playing off of that, hopefully, you know, we'll work on the fantasy side of things. Thanks for your question, Liz. Um, Nafisa and Kathy, I want to talk about how um, what's happened in, in 2020 so far has affected women in sports. And, and Nafisa, from the pandemic to the rally for social justice, how, how, have, how has that helped, do you think, change the perception of women in sport? Um, I would say just, I mean, this is something that isn't really different since the pandemic and social justice. Um, it's something that we've been advocating for for a long time. I think, you know, the pandemic kind of helped in terms of there wasn't much to do. So we can watch this and like, oh, now I'm a fan because the biggest thing is getting out there and having people watch. They don't understand or they are just closed minded to it. And so once you get eyes on it, then you start getting fans You're like, oh, this is fun to watch. This is interesting. They're really competitive. It's an interesting game to watch. So I think it's just getting more eyes and that's one benefit to the pandemic was there's wasn't people that were able to go out. So like Kathy said, we had more engagement in the draft and with jersey sales and things like that. So um, just finding positives in that, I guess. I was gonna say, Nafisa, uh, that you're amazing in the sense that you have this really positive at attitude and there's lots of obstacles maybe in front of everybody right now, but you're finding you have this very positive energy in a way of looking at things a little bit differently and saying, I'm going to, I'm going to work my way around it or through it, or it's, it's going to happen. So if you're reflecting at all, um, the other, your other colleagues and players, I can definitely see where this will be a big win. 
I think Kathy was one of the first commissioners to um, approve like the draft, right? Weren't you guys uh, sort of in the forefront there, if I remember correctly, and in the forefront of a lot. And I think that a lot of times women um, and strong women in, in crisis come together and move forward in a way that we just wouldn't have expected under normal circumstances. So I, I'm going to bet on, on all of you. I think that we're going to see a lot of change and a lot of really good, good things come out of this time period, whether it's the pandemic, the, um, you know, un, you know, un, um, justified and unprecedented um, deaths um, that have occurred and the whole social justice um, awareness that so many of us, you know, really didn't understand um, until these last few months. Uh, for example, understanding that there are mothers out there who are worried about their sons going out and in, in, um, into the public because they don't know if they'll come home that day because of the color of their skin. And that's like, that's scary. So when you start looking at it that way, it's like, okay, how can we change this dialogue and make a change and an impact going forward? So I'm excited to see what you guys are doing with your committee. And uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about that too. Kathy, we've talked a lot about the challenges that you faced over the last few months. What are some of the opportunities that have emerged that you that you would take from this time um, where you see actually that that's interesting? I wouldn't have predicted that. Yeah. So um, as I said, with any with any crisis, um, you know, you your weaknesses are amplified, but your opportunities also become clearer. And I think you know the social engagement campaign that I think will end up educating and inspiring youth and families and fans and the general public that will come out of this will be a huge opportunity. I think even maybe some interesting things around this global health pandemic and crisis and how we're putting on this season, which is not without risk, but trying to obviously have as our number one priority, the health and safety of our players and staff and how that might work and that might help the college game you know, because we need women college sports and you see some universities maybe cutting sports and I know they'll cut women's sports as well. Uh, and so making sure that we can provide a role model and a platform and really it's just all about the players. I mean, when this pandemic happened, my number one thing was what, because I knew we were going to have to defer the tip of the season and we were the first ones out there with a virtual draft a week before the NFL, let me add. Um, so we had our first ever virtual draft. But but getting the players into, you know, um, the Ernie Johnson on NBA Twitter, or um, actually we had a, a Hall of Fame inductee supposed to be inducted this year, and a current player on the NBA horse competition. Um, and we had the NBA 2K tournament where I had a WNBA player in the tournament. We had public service announcements across social and digital platforms. We had Instagram Lives and Twitter Q&As and junior NBA at home workouts where Afisa, I think you did you did one of them, and um, you know just really so people could see their voices, people could see their personalities, and and again we could draw more quality in the coverage for our sport. And we are not there yet. This is like pushing a big boulder up the hill, and we're pushing it inch by inch. But we need to get it to the top, and we need to do it for all of women's sports. And quite frankly, my goal, and I said this at the conference a few months ago, my goal is you know so that young girls stop dropping out of organized sports at alarming rates compared to their male counterparts. And that's what someone like Nafisa Kali or her role model is providing role models to young boys and girls, but we need more coverage of them. So more, we can affect more than we affect today. K Kathy, I have a question for you about the, um, the uh, teams, the owners, when they're, you know, the the price that owners pay for a, a team in the WNBA versus the NBA or the average support or sponsorship that you're getting um, versus maybe the male counterparts. How disparate is that? What is the, is it, is it a great difference? Yes. I mean, I think anybody knows how disparate uh, the difference is in valuation because it comes down to revenue, revenue models, financial models, and that's one of the things we're trying to transform. The pandemic has hit us a bit here. 
uh, but we need to drive franchise value. And how do you drive transfer franchise value? You need more sponsors, you need more revenues, you need more revenue sources, you need better media deals, you need you know, better corporate sponsorship deals. And that's why the WNBA Changemaker platform is out there for as a call to action company. So when we grow, if you're a growth business, as you know from your business, and I know from having been in business for over three decades, and you, that will attract investment. Investment attracts things you can do to grow the sport and grow the league. And then your valuation of your franchise goes up. And that's exactly what the plan is, is to drive the valuations higher. And therefore, you'll have more investment to go invest in the things to drive more fan engagement, to drive more technology, to transform league pass, to transform you know, the fan experience, to pay the players more, to offer the players more off-season employment, things like that. So that's absolutely what we're working on uh, and we're working on before the pandemic hit. And now again, now it's health and safety and protocols and testing and make sure we can survive this pandemic and then thrive thereafter and drive franchise value. But there's a huge disparity today. We don't use it to compare ourselves, but we use history to take a look at, you know, we're only in our 24th season. If you look back 40 years into the NBA, they were still on tape delay. They didn't have the platform they all have today financially or revenue model wise. So, you know, you do have to study history of men's sports because women's sports is still pretty new, but mm -hmm. you know, we're the only ones that will have lasted over two decades and got to our silver anniversary next year. So I'm pretty proud of what I inherited here, but there's a total transformation of the economics to make this work long-term and for the future of these players and these young players like Nafisa. And Nafisa, what, what keeps you in the game and, and who, who are your mentors and how do you then mentor uh, the next generation? Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, Maya Moore, one of the you know, stars of the Lynx, we are from the same town. Um, so I kind of followed her throughout my childhood and you know, we went to the same college and now the same WNBA team. So uh, she was someone I really, look, really looked up to growing up. And I want to be that for someone else, too. Um, just like Kathy said, being a mentor is really important, especially for young girls, keeping them engaged in sports and giving them um, a role model that maybe isn't a male. Maybe it's a woman, someone you aspire to be in, whether that sport or something else or whatever it is. Someone, a positive person that you can look up to that say, you know, I want to be like that when I grow up. So I really take a lot of pride in that. And I try to reflect that anytime I'm on the court or anything in the way that I present myself, um, because I know that there are little kids looking up to us and um, I want to be that for someone like Maya was for me. That's awesome. I, I and, and maybe just Juliet, uh, maybe Nafisa, I know um, you had a relationship with Kobe Bryant. And, you know, if you think about 2020 for our league, David Stern died. Who, start, who launched the WNBA and was the former commissioner on January 1. A couple weeks later, Kobe Bryant and those three young girls, their coaches and their parents. So I know Nafisa has a really, had a relationship with Kobe. Maybe talk a little bit about that because before all this other stuff, this was going to be an important part of our season this year as well as dedicating it to those young girls. Yeah, and um, one thing about Kobe that was amazing and something that he didn't keep a secret was his um, – how proud he was of the women's sport and how he wanted to help elevate it. You saw him at games, um, you know, one of the last pictures was him in the WNBA sweatshirt, orange uh, sweatshirt with Gigi. Um, so you saw how he was trying to elevate the game. And I thought that was amazing. It was something I really looked up to about him. Um, so yeah, having that happen was devastating for everyone. It was such a tragedy. Uh, but I think that people should take his message and see that he understood one of the greats to ever play the sport um, was a huge advocate for the women's game, and that says a lot. Uh, so that was amazing, and I thought it was so well done. The tribute, at the draft. Um, so yeah, I thought that was amazing. And, and he was a um, he was a big supporter of the collective bargaining agreement as well, right, Kathy? I remember you sharing a really a really touching story at the summit about about that. Yeah, I mean, and and. He was just, as Nafisa just said, a huge advocate for the league. And not just because Gigi was this amazing young player and he knew she was going to play someday, but I, I just think he really loved the women's game and the pureness of it. And, and people like Nafisa and some of our other players who just play that pure form of the game, and he appreciated that. Um, and obviously having you know, the daughters as well helped that advocacy. And so um, 
we, we did launch at the, or announce at our draft, the um, Kobe and Gigi Bryan Advocacy Award for the WNBA. So we're in another call to action for others to advocate like Kobe did. And we lost a huge advocate and we need to carry on his legacy through uh, dry, dr drawing other advocates into the league. Cause he, he really, it, it's, it's like, I was pretty amazed cause I didn't know Kobe before I came into the role. I mean, he was the first and only NBA player at that time that came in and to my office and said, I, I, I want to help. How do I help? I want to invest in the league you guys need to transform. I mean, he knew that we had a whole transformation ahead of us. And that was before we then did the collective bargaining agreement. And I think I reported that he, you know, I didn't, I met Kobe once and he texted me, you know, with a big thumbs up. And uh, after the collective bargaining agreement was announced and then two weeks later, you know, the tragedy occurred. And so again, this is a way to um, carry on his legacy as well through this advocacy award. And we hope again, it's a call to action. And, and since then I have had several NBA players reach out who are becoming, already were, but behind the scenes becoming big advocates and stepping up, but not just NBA players. We'll, we'll take any, anyone to continue to advocate for these elite women. That's great. Uh, we've got time. We've got time for a couple more questions. Um, there's one from Richard Strong uh, for Nafisi. Richard, are you there? Hi, Richard. Need to unmute Richard. I'll share his question, Nafisa, and if he comes on, we, we can flip. But he, he was asking how you use, um, what social platform do you use to engage with your fans? Um, are you a fan of TikTok? Um, or, <laughs> and do you see um, any big differences between Instagram, Twitter, TikTok? What one do you using? The one that I use the most is Instagram. I'm not a huge tweeter. I usually just kind of creep on Twitter and like things that are funny. Um, I also like watching TikTok. I don't have one. So Instagram is definitely the place that I'm most active on. The piece of 24 is my at. We'll be, we'll be following you. We'll be following you after this. Um, there's another question from um, Eamon, Eamon Store, if you're there. Hi, Eamon. Uh, Hi, Eamon. Hi there. Yeah, no, fascinating uh, conversation. Thank you very much. I was just curious if you're down in the wobble, what the um, environmental impact is of not traveling around so much, not flying around, and if you're able to measure it. Because uh, presumably there's a positive impact from that. Yeah, I think it's a great it's a great question, Iman. Um, it, one of the things I think just um, the economic impact of us being here on the region, uh, in addition to kind of not having a 36 game season where you're traveling to 12 different cities and you know by by commercial airline uh, and all of that. So, but I, I think probably that that's absolutely an environmental impact, but also the economic impact we can have on this region and a region that needs it right now, I think is, is important. And we're trying, we're definitely trying to measure that. Uh, IMG Academy has been great partners. The city of Bradenton, I met with their tourism director the other day, great partners. Um, you know, they, they just are really excited that these players are here, they're elite and they, they know they want them to come back, Nafisa. So, <laughs> um, you know, because they're a world-class, uh, best-in-class training facility. And although we can't use everything because we're in our confined area and we can't go out to dinner and restaurants and things like that in the area, um, we have a huge economic impact on, on, on the area from um, things like, I'm sure our players are ordering delivery, groceries, things like that. Uh, and, and then, you know, ultimately what we're bringing into the economy here. So we're definitely going to measure that. And we'll, we'll, I think it's a good idea to look at the environmental impact too, because it's a 600 acre campus and, you know, players are biking and walking and, you know, electric golf carts and things like that, rather than, you know, flying everywhere and driving everywhere. So it's a really good thing to think through. Thank you, Eamon. And we've got, uh, we're going to have one more question from the audience from Rob um, Colorina. Rob, I know you had a question about the next next generation development. Hi, Rob. Hi, Juliet, uh, Kathleen. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. I, I think they did a great job on um, the, uh, the mentorship of the next generation. That was, uh, so I'm going to shift it for a moment because I don't think it's been brought up. Um, commissioner and, and, and maybe Nafisa as a player, 
Um, what are y'all doing with respect to um, the international side from either players or from potential expansion? And um, I might say that um, um, I still play and enjoy the, uh, the hoops game and, and we're past Deloy clients as well. <laughs> That's great to hear. Um, international. So um, obviously, again, another thing before the pandemic, we had some interest in maybe doing scrimmages outside the U.S. Uh, obviously, right now we're in all uh, U.S. league scrim, you know, playing some exhibition games. I probably shouldn't call them scrimmages, exhibition games outside the U.S. So there is a big interest in women's basketball outside of the United States. Obviously, our players, many of our players on the offseason go play in Europe and Asia. Uh, and have for many, many years, um, that, that's also there. Um, but also expansion in general is something that certainly is part of the strategy. It would have been down the road because we're trying to transform the league and transform the ecosystem around the league. So expansion definitely is still on the table uh, and whether it's inside the US or outside because that's one of the other frustrations I had coming in when you're only in 12 cities in a country of the size and scale of the United States uh, and for instance, you don't have a team in the Bay Area and you don't have a team in Philadelphia and Boston and Houston and Detroit and, you know, in, in Florida. And um, so, you know, looking at pockets, um, you know, I was out in Oregon this year to see the Oregon, Oregon State game and, um, you know, women's basketball, they're crazy there in that area for women's basketball. And obviously Tennessee, they're crazy. So you have to pick the right markets. And there have been franchises in some of these markets I even just named in the past. Uh, but that's why we have to transform the league first and the economics of the league, and then we'll move on to expansion. Thank you, Rob, for that question. So a closing question, I think, um, Firthi, Kathy and Whistle, what, what, um, what, what are the bright spots you see um, and, and, and what gives you hope, kind of seeing, seeing what, what the WNBA are doing for, for women and for equality and women in sport? Absolutely. So um, meeting Kathy at the Women in Worth conference, I followed the uh, WNBA a little bit closer after that because it was like inspiring to see the direction of where it was going. And um, I thought it was pretty interesting seeing the WNBA having their, you know, having their um, draft first, as Kathy said, and, and things like that. So I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity going forward for um, women and men uh, to support women in whatever it is that they're doing. And in this case, sports um, and sports have, we've all known for many years that sports has a huge impact in leadership, in collaboration, in getting things accomplished, in, um, you know, gaining strength and, and uh, longevity, you know, in terms of our, our strength. So, so I think that that is all positive. And um, I also think it's positive that women in general have taken a, a viewpoint that I have to put my oxygen mask on first, have to take care of my wellness, my physical being. And, and also, you know, I'm, I'm in the finance world, so I have to say it, the financial, your financial health is very, very important too, because that's a big stress factor for many. So yeah, I'm very positive on all of that. Thank you. And, and Kathy, um, what, are the, what are the bright spots that you see on the horizon? I know you've got a, a, an intense few weeks ahead. Yeah, so I mean, huge bright spot. The players are on the court in training camp, and I'm sure Nafis is so happy that they've gotten out of quarantine. They're on the court. It just warmed my heart the day I went over to the practice facility and just watched some of them practice. And I mean, this is what it's all about. Like, literally, my heart got warm. We're so worried about all the health and safety protocols. But getting on the court, the rivalries, the storylines, the first weekend around Black Lives Matter uh, and how important that is to the players and the tip off our 24th season, huge bright spot. And then the platform around social justice and how important that is, um, you know, just really to see the whole collective bargaining agreement now pay off and come to life and that put on a season and fingers crossed everything goes well over the next week and a half and we tip off on the 25th. Um, I think you're playing that day, Faye, so get ready. <laughs> I know, I am. <laughs> and and Navisa, what, what, what are you excited about most with, for the season? Yeah, um, as a player, we're so excited to be here. This is what we love to do is to play. And so finally to have games right around the corner, um, you know, in a week almost, a week and a half, it's so exciting. So it felt so good. Like Kathy said, when we had practice and we could all be on the court for the first time together because – before that, we were doing like individual workouts, but to all come together and to practice and for it to feel like a season and like we're playing the sport we love, it was amazing. So I'm just so excited for games to start and to get our season 
going. Thank you. Kathy, Nafisa and Kathy, thank you so much for such a, a wonderful discussion into the future of sport for women and for all that you're doing for um, social justice and to support a more inclusive economy and society. The, the work that you're all doing is so incredibly valuable and impactful to, to us and, and the next generation. Um, and wishing you all the best in, in the season ahead as well. And, and thank you just for making the time to have this conversation, given how much you've got going on down there. Um, a special thanks also to Kathy Entwistle at Morgan Stanley for being our partner for this series. And most importantly, thanks to everyone that joined us today and for your great questions. We hope you enjoyed it. Please do share any feedback with us. We'd love to hear your comments and any topics that you'd like to cover in the future. You can email us at community at worth.com. Next week at Worth Live, tune in on Tuesday at 4 p.m. for our Future of Cities series. We'll be speaking to Savannah Mayor Van Johnson on the resilience of cities. Uh, Wednesday at four, we launch our new Worth Insights series focused on the change and transformation in marketing. And on Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern time, we'll be back again with the next normal, taking a look at how vacationing is changing in a pandemic ridden world. Um, please register online at worth.com forward slash events for all of this and all of our events, as well as sign up for our weekly newsletter. In the meantime, stay well, stay healthy, be kind and stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much, speakers. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Lisa and Kathy, you were great. And we'd love to figure out how we can help support you guys a little bit more. I think that would be good. Thank great. Thank you, Kathleen. Everybody stay healthy. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.